Hello, I'm Bernice Akubedo Lanza, and you just saw highlights of that documentary put together by my colleague Richard Kojunyako. Let's now discuss the fallout from that latest hotline documentary, uh, When the Last Fish is Caught. In, in the report you just saw, what Richard does is to investigate how Ghana is dealing with the issue of illegal, unregulated, and underreported fishing and how the fisheries resources could be recovered. I've been joined in studio uh, by a gentleman who's been working in this industry, Mr. Kofi Agboga. He's executive director of Hen Mpwana. That's Fanti, if you understand Fanti, that's what our coast, Hen Mpwana. It's good to have you here, Mr. Agboga. And I, and I see you while we were playing the highlights, you just kept shaking your head, really dis there have been uh, uh, events we have there, and it looks like people are justifying uh, the illegality on our seas. What is illegal is illegal. The law is very clear. If you look at Section 131 of the Fisheries Act, it outlaws transshipment at sea, and it says that if you want to transship fish, it has to be supervised. Mm. And if it has to be supervised, you have to write to the commission for you to get the approval before you transship the fish. And this must be done at port. So if people go out there to sea and move fish from one vessel to, the another, uh, to another, that is illegal. Mm. in all respects. Mm. So nobody should justify why if they do it, it creates jobs and others. it is illegal. Mm. So, so earlier um, I, I said illegal, unreported, and uh, I, I tried to just explain what the IUU was. Let me, let me just bring clarity. So it's illegal, unreported, and unregulated fishing. And that's what we are discussing here today and how we need to deal with the problem as it is. And Mr. Agboga has just said that there's nothing that justifies uh, that particular activity. But let's look at the, the practice itself. We know that people are involved in this. In fact, government has in time, times past when my colleague did a documentary focusing on cycle. Uh, we had responses, we had uh, assurances, and we were told that there was work being done. What do you see from where you sit? Is government paying lip service, or are there efforts being made to deal with the problem? Well, government is not paying lip service, though government is challenged in many respects, but at least through the back and forth, the trawlers themselves came out to say clearly and loudly that uh, they're going to stop the transshipment mm. at sea. The challenge is that they, they catch fish that they are not supposed to catch. Mm. And once you are not licensed to catch that fish, they find it difficult to bring it down. So they have to find other ways. To, to bring it to shore? Yes, to shore. Okay. When so, you say they, they catch fish that they are not licensed to catch, help us understand how this is. Because I'm sure someone is thinking, but how do you tell what kind of fish you're going to catch? You just cast your net. I mean, in the layman's uh, world, we know you just cast your net. And whatever fish you catch, you catch it and bring it home. Fishermen are scientists. The whole fisheries industry is based upon science. There is a fisherman who can put his leg in the water and tell you the temperature of the water. They can look at the surface of the water and know exactly which fish is there. The licensing regime for the trawlers is for them to go out there to catch only bottom dwelling fish. So they go deep. They have to go down. And when they go down, they have to open their net in such a way that it only sweeps the bottom fish. This fish that they are catching swims only at the top. So if you lower your net to the bottom, you are going to catch only bottom-dwelling fish. Of course, 
as you raise the net or as you do your business, there may be some stray fish that goes in there. But because this is a legal business, because they want enough fish to catch, to sell, make profits before they go for their licensed fish, they go up, open their net very wide and target the surface fish that they are not supposed to target. And that is what is worrying because the surface fish is supposed to be for the canoe fishermen. Mm -hmm. And now when they harvest all those fish, the canoe fishermen do not have any fish. And this is creating a lot of poverty in the fishing communities. Mm. And these pet trawlers, uh, in times past, uh, we were told were owned by foreigners. Is that still the case or we have locals involved in these large vessels that are supposed to do only the deep fishing? First, let me say that uh, there is nothing like pet trolling in Ghana, okay. but there is trolling. Okay. That is one. And once these people have been licensed to go out there and catch what they are supposed to catch, that is what the law allows them. Is it that the law does not permit pet trolling or that people don't do petroling at all. The law does not permit petroling. Because you see, there's something trolling, like that. It makes it sound like people don't engage in it. No, people don't engage people in People don't it. engage in it. Petroling means that, let me explain, that if you go to the beach and this dragnet or sea net people, one group is here, one group is on the other end, and they pull. The same way some time pass, you have two vessels. similar vessels. One has the net at the end, the other has the net, and then they pull Run together. together. That is pair trolling, two doing one trolling. But now it is only one vessel, vessel with a net behind it, and it pulls along. So that is trolling mm -hmm. and not pair trolling. Mm -hmm. I hope yeah, yeah, that that's clarifies clear. the issue. Yes. Mm. So, so back in concluding uh, the, the response to governments, actions in dealing with this uh, issue of Seiko and people catching these fish that they're not licensed to handing them over to other vessels to be taken beyond the shores of Ghana which is clearly illegal what have you seen to be the the most important indicator for you that government is serious about fighting this at least for now the minister has been very tough on people who do this kind of fishing. Mm. And uh, largely, they have stopped bringing down the cycle fish to the known ports of uh, Elmina and Apam. But a, a new phenomenon is coming up gradually, mm. and the ministry and the commission will have to look at it critically and investigate and come out with solutions to their problems. Mm. What is happening is that now, when the trawlers catch this fish, they don't sell it to fishermen any longer. They put them in cartons and bring them down to the thermal port. And then vans, refrigerated vans and other vans come to thermal, take this same fish that ordinarily, mm. will be coming from the canoes to the ports, and they send them back to the communities to sell. And now they are putting into cartons anchovies, for instance, baby fish. Yeah. And these are added to their catch, and they are submitted at, as catches from the trawlers. What it means is that all of a sudden, you realize that the volumes of fish that the trawlers are reporting has gone up drastically because it includes the fish but, that were But at the port, aren't there officials there to inspect these cartons? Aren't they supposed to know that they're not supposed to be catching such fish? It, it appears that, from what you're saying, this is not smuggling, sort of. It's, it's done in the full glare of officials. Well, you see, when the fish comes out, it is not labeled fish Kofi or fish mensa or something in the box. Mm. They just put A, B, C, D in uh, on the uh, boxes. 
But those who are in the business know which bo box contains what. Mm. It is up to the commission to be extra vigilant, mm. do spot checks, sample checks, and see if what is are in these boxes. Mm. Uh, these things pass without them opening them, and therefore they 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 are unable to tell which fish is in which box unless they open a few of the boxes mm. to see what is there. But those who are in that business know exactly what they are doing. I think that the commission will have to be extra resourced and be extra vigilant to be able to sample every boat that is berthing at the port and what kinds of fish they are landing and question why the volumes of fish that the trawlers are landing has all of a sudden mm -hmm. gone up. I'll come back to you to find out what solutions uh, can be adopted by the ministry. But let me uh, welcome Moses Enim, Deputy Minister for Fisheries and Aquaculture Development. Uh, he joins the conversation. Uh, thank you so much, sir, for your time here this morning. So I've been talking to uh, Mr. Agboga, and he's mentioned that, <clears throat> I beg your pardon, in his opinion, government is not just paying lip service to the fight against illegal and unregulated fishing, but he thinks more can be done. We know that the EU has issued us with a, with a yellow card because of IUU in our fishery sector. Um, like he said, a lot is being done, but we've, we've, we still have issues in the fishery sector. I just want to find out from you what further measures are being taken, one, to ensure that that yellow card is reversed and uh, we don't have a possible ban on exporting fish from Ghana to other parts of the world. Thank you very much. Let me say hi to my brother Kofi Agboga and you as well and your viewers. Le, because you were talking about uh, the cycle or the transshipment, let me concentrate there as to what we're really doing to also, uh, so by so uh, doing, we, we're solving this situation where we are being deemed uncooperative to with our EU counterparts. Uh, as a result of we seeing that by law, transshipment or what they call cycle, which is uh, some illegal uh, relation between the, the trough fleets and our, our artisanal fleets, uh, is illegal and we said we ban it. Uh, we also trying to Hello, Mr. Enim. Too bad. Uh, it appear... Hello. Hello. Sorry, we lost you. Uh, Hello. For... We lost you for a few seconds, sir. Uh, please continue. Okay. So I'm saying, all right. I'm saying that we're using the new gear regime as an additional action to ensure that we bring sanity. Um, the, either to the trough fleets, we're using a 40 meter vertical opinion with a wider circumference. We've given them directive and we've done the prototype. The vertical opening now is a 10 meter uh, vertical opening. The circumference of the opening is 60 meters now. We are also saying that when you come to the cord end, the cord end, they are taking out the constraining strides because the constraining strides will, will tighten the cord end to the point that he can't let loose or he can't let out uh, juveniles that have traversed up to the cord end. We are also saying that at the cord end, we are expecting only a single bladed material. And that, that, that is the, the, what we've given them. And the cord end must, must be 10 meters of length. We are saying that the circumference should be around 5.1 meters or to say in terms of number of measures, uh, uh, 80, 80, 80, 80, 82 uh, 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 measures around it. So at the end of the day, we're going to start that one with the uh, 1st September mm -hmm. and we've obliged them that it is also linked to the renewal of the alliances. In fact, at port, there's going to be an inspection. There's going to be an inspection at sea. Okay. That's, uh, that, that, that's, uh, that's an interesting one. Uh, it's, it's just interesting to note that 
despite with 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 if if I can complete, then you sorry the pause of what I want. Sorry, sorry, there was a long pause. I thought you had ended. Please continue. Yeah. So when we are we've succeeded in that, it will reduce drastically because at the end of the day, they are licensed to catch or concentrate their catch on demersas, which are bottom dwell species. They are not supposed to cast a net that would that <laughs> that would come up. I'm sorry, I think we'd have to uh, try and work on Mr. Enim's line so that we can have uh, a more fluid conversation with him. But let me come back in studio. And uh, Mr. Agboga, Executive Director of Hen Mpwano, is still here with me. So you heard him mention some of the measures they've put in place. I remember we were talking about the size of net and the, and the fact that sometimes they're catching fish at the, at, at, at the top of the ocean when you're supposed to be going deep down to the seabed. So you've just heard him talk about um, the, the difference in the net sizes and the openings. And what's your, what's your impression about that? Well, it is a very good beginning. If instead of opening the net very high, now they only limit themselves to 10 meters from the bottom, then you know that those on the surface could uh, escape the, their nets. Secondly, he also talked about the mesh size of the nets, that uh, the directive has uh, asked that they make it bigger so that small fish that stray into it can swim out, and then it doesn't have to cover a wide area, it talks about 10 meters and 60 uh, um, uh, centim uh, centimeters and all that. So I think it is a good beginning. We will work with the ministry and the industry to ensure that all these things that are being said are actually uh, done in practice. Uh, there is a tendency that uh, when you inspect these nets at the Ports, mm. they show you the right nets. But then when they go out to sea, your guess is as good as mine. People have even hinted that there are canoes that meet these boats and uh, carry the illegal nets to them. Sometimes I do not think that uh, it is true because the troll nets are very big and uh, you need a very huge boat that will carry the nets to them. That said, I think that uh, for us in Ghana and for everybody in the sectors, we have very good laws. Implementation is the problem. Sometimes there's patronage, political interference, and then the omissions and commissions of the staff who are working at the ports or who are supposed to be policing the fish system. If uh, people come and they declare different, you know, in the trawl sector, it is the trawlers who must uh, declare how much they have caught. Mm. And then uh, they take their log books to the commission to cross-check. Many times, the trawlers are saying that they have the right records. The ministry doesn't have the right records. So what the ministry is turning out is not the right thing. But... It is the ministry which, who is clothed with the power to tell how much fish we have, and we cannot controvert that. So if the trawlers have a different means of uh, calculating how much they have caught, they have to sit down with the ministry and say, this is the system we are using, this is the, uh, the numbers that we have. I think that somewhere in between the line, because of tax purposes and all that, they know what they have, and they declare some other numbers in order to go around the system. And uh, so there, there, is, there is a lot of work to be done in this. In that uh, regard. Place. Right. Uh, <clears throat> I'm told we have Mr. Enim back on the line. Uh, sorry, sir. The network was quite dodgy, so we lost you there. But you were just finishing on your uh, new measures to be introduced on the 1st of September, you say, uh, to help deal with the issue of illegal, unreported, and unregulated fishing in, in the country? 
Yeah, so we, I was talking about the trough fleets. So we have others, but let's concentrate on the trough fleets. That is the, the issue at stake uh, you discussing. And at the end of the day, we've taken them through all the necessary training. Uh, our observers are, are being trained, the inspectors and all. But let me also come back to it that um, the, 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 as a result of them, let, for want of word, being recalcitrant in, in, in obeying the rules and then the regulation, is the reason why even the bycatch allowance, we've, 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 we've cancelled the 15%, which some of us thought that it was too high, because the 15% alone for 600 cartons, just calculate or for, for, for any uh, ton, tonnage or any kilogram of fish and you give allowance for 15% by catch, which, which by definition is an inadvertent uh, catch of fish that you don't want to catch or you are not licensed to catch. So we said we're giving zero tolerance to that one because at the end of the day, these are people that we're working with and, and whilst we're trying to instill the discipline and ensure that uh, the right things are done, uh, by the time you say Jack, they are somewhere doing something else. Mm -hmm. So whilst we become successful, in the gear regime and also make sure that the bycatch issues are also reduced to bare minimum. The juveniles will stay, the small pelagic that are for artisanal uh, will also stay. We are also saying that there should be labeling. Now the captains are going to be labeled. We've taken the captains and then the Ghanaian, uh, the Ghanaian who own the land through all that. We're bringing in best practice, the standard way of labeling. Because my sister, you don't go to the market and you want to buy a particular product which has not been labeled. Mm. So we've given the species must be declared as labeled and each species, whichever species in the box, must be labeled. This, the name of the species must be there so that when you're going to buy, you know you want to buy the mesa, you want to buy this particular species, you will get it. Then our inspectors now can go and take the boxes, sample them, and then you've labeled them this one as this particular species. When they open it up, they must see that species. Because if you label it and what is in the box is different, that is you infringe the law. So we try to bring all these things together because the boxes are not labeled. When they are not labeled and they are blank, and it tells you this is a particular species in there, sampling becomes very difficult. Mm. But when you separate them and you label with species, then the one who is coming to inspect can then bring a box out, knows that you label it A, B, C, D, and then he, or in the sizes and all, we're saying that we're going to do it, and we train them through it from self First September, we know it's going to be difficult because uh, the, uh, our, our, the buyers of the fish also have some labeling that is not best practice. Some they call A, some they call B. These are not best practice. We should know which species. So though we're starting, and I think it's a rightful step to start, and whilst we're evaluating and monitoring going ahead, we'll be shaping ourselves. So these are some of the few things that I can mention for now. But I can also say, that whatever we have to do in other other areas where we need our inspectors to be very strong and be honest and truthful, where our observers are so, so supposed to be very strong and honest and, and, and truthful, we've also ensured that our VMS, there's going to be an upgrade of the vessel monitoring uh, system and the AIS, we, 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 uh, the service provider, we're trying to renew the agreement we are with him on that score to upgrade it. So we can have an eye also at, 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 at the high seas. And we, we're trying to move towards uh, rare time situations where at least uh, whatever pin drops at the high seas, at least we can see it. We're looking at cameras, CCTV cameras installed on, on vessels and all that. I think when we are successful in this, and our canoe people also, also stop. Hello, Mr. Nin. Uh, quickly, I, I hope we'll be able to get him again for his final thoughts on this conversation. But uh, back to you in studio. He mentions the use of technology in helping. In fact, that was going to be a follow-up question to him because this government has been very heavy on the use of technology and digitization to try to deal with some of the problems that have existed for so long. Does that make it better for you? Because initially, 
uh, you you said that the, the changing of the dimensions of the nets and the openings was a good start, but he's added on. Beyond that, we are hoping to use technology as well. Yeah, the use of technology has <coughs> been around for some time, and even the law recognizes the use of technology. The deputy minister talked about uh, the AIS and VMS. These are just satellite televisions that allow you to see the positions of the vessels, whether they are in the uh, legal zone or they are in the illegal zone. I remember some time ago there was an experiment that we called the uh, areas beyond national jurisdiction where cameras have been fixed on the uh, tuna vessels, about eight or 12 cameras looking at every angle on the boat. So whatever activity is taking place, you can either see it in real time or when the vessel comes to port, you collect the hard disk and analyze everything that has gone on. So it is a step in the right direction. Uh, there are challenges when it comes to VMS and airtime and uh, continuous paying for credit and uh, all that. But uh, as a nation, we have to look at what we are capable of doing. There is also the international system called the AIS, Automatic Identification System, where every vessel on the sea, anywhere in the world, you can see it if you are interested in that particular vessel. Now the, the technology could also be extended to the canoes, not in, uh, particularly for monitoring them, but if I have my car and there is a little gadget which is a tracker, which is on the car, at least it allows me to know exactly where my vehicle is at any point in time. Mm -hmm. These things can be modified and canoes can also have them. So at any time we know who is out there and uh, who is at port and all that. Technology is very good. Uh, I think also that within the canoe sector, there's the canoe identification card, which uh, purportedly will be used to even buy the premix fuel. Mm. That if you have the mm. card and you slot mm. in, it registers just like your ATM card. So anybody who is in charge of the system will know whether you have bought 10 gallons of fuel or 20 gallons of fuel and so forth. So at the end of the day, there can be tabulation to know whether there's diversion, there's no diversion. So why, why is premix fuel such a... It, it appears to be quite a scarce commodity that there has to be rationing. Can't it be available? Can't it be... Uh, because I know that there are people responsible for receiving and then people come and buy, you know, and all that. But there, there, there have been political interferences. There have, there have been issues of hoarding. Why is premix, premix fuel such a scarce commodity? I don't think it is a scarce commodity. Mm. At this time, it is simply not there. You and I, when we drive our cars, we are paying 11 CDs or 12 CDs for a gallon of fuel. This same fuel, there are additives and others added, and you give it to fishermen, let's say, five CDs. So you see on every gallon how much government is losing. In the last few years, government has been subsidizing premiums for nearly $50 million a year. So they go and buy it at uh, 10 CDs, they sell it at 4 CDs. Now the dollars, we all have economic crisis. That is my take. Mm. If you go and buy the fuel, will you continue to subsidize? Should, uh, so these fishermen <coughs> are engaged in private business. Mm but they receive subsidized fuel mm. from government. Should we begin to look at, like some have said, when it even comes to utilities, should we begin to encourage them to pay the, the true amount um, so that you know, we can wean ourselves off this issue of subsidies from government so the sector itself can generate its own income, grow, uh, to the point where government won't have to spend, do you say, $50 million on subsidizing premix fuel? You see, fishermen will argue that if you give fertilizer subsidy to farmers, 
what are they benefiting? But the subsidy for fertilizers on land and the dynamics is a little or slightly different from what is at sea. There is a model which says that if you continue to subsidize the fuel, it makes the fishing activity very cheap for the fisherman, and therefore he wants more fuel to go. But I tell you, if you bring the tour or the refinery to the beach, and you give every fisherman whatever they want, they can travel from here to Brazil. They come back with empty net because there's fish that they are supposed to catch. It's not available. Declining fish stock. It's not available for them to catch. That is one. So if fishermen still ask that they are giving fuel, this must be thought through carefully. There is an international push that such subsidies be removed completely so that people will know their smoothness level. You buy, you go. If you don't have the money, you don't go. Now, if you go to our fishing communities, every fisherman owes one woman or the other. Because, you see, the fisherman is like a lotto forecaster. He doesn't win today, he'll win tomorrow. So he comes to you, can I get money to buy fuel? Maybe today it will be good. He goes, it is not good. Tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow. Occasionally, they will meet a you school a good of fish. Catch. And, but by and large, they owe everybody to the extent that now the banks, the rural banks and the microfinance guys who are giving soft, soft loans for these activities to do. So they cannot pay. So it's becoming a fruitless venture then. I mean, so you're putting money into a venture where you're not really sure you make enough profits. And the argument here is that if you're paying the right amount, you'll be more calculated in how and when you go to the sea. But the other angle of the issue of, of a declining fish stock is that Ghana has to import fish to, to cater for its population. And that today uh, on, 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 on the 6 a.m. news on Joy FM, we did a story about the rising cost of imported meat and fish. And every time you go to a cold store, every time it's increased, also because of how the CD is performing against the, the foreign currencies. How do we deal with the problem of declining fish stock? Then it addresses the issue both of meeting our local needs, reducing their importation, and also ensuring that when a farmer goes to sea, he doesn't lose. You see, it is a very complex problem. The declining stocks, a lot of people has, uh, have uh, attributed it to climate. Even if you read some of the FAO documents, they say the fishes are moving northwards. Fine. The little that we have, how do we protect them? In our studies, the trawlers between maybe 2015 coming down were catching about 100,000 metric tons of juvenile fish, which are meant for canoe fishermen. These are baby fishes. So if you allow these fish to grow maybe three times their size, you already have 300,000 metric tons of fish. And the trawlers don't catch or destroy them. These fish will be available for the fishermen to catch. Historically, what is our highest uh, landing of the pelagics? Maybe 256,000 metric tons. And now we are destroying about 300,000 metric tons before they even grow to the size that we have to catch them. If we do our things right, if we are able to stem some of these things, if, our, if we allow the small fish to grow to maturity, at least. But, but that's why government initiated the closed sea. Yes, I'm, I'm, I'm coming to that. But at least if we allow them to grow to their first maturity or to give birth at least once before we catch them. We know that uh, there will be some fish for us. Mm -hmm. Again, all of us say that June, July, August is the bumper season. This is the bumper season because the fish are gravid, or let me put it in the local balance, 
pregnant with eggs, they are ready to discharge these eggs into the water. They are weak. It takes a nine-month-old woman who cannot, therefore, they are easily available to be caught. What the close season is there to do now is to allow this fish during the peak of the reproductive season to shed the eggs into the water even before they are caught. We have done our calculations and we know that if you close the season in May, you have about 5% gains. If you close it in June, you have about 30%. If you close it in uh, July, August, you have about 50% or 60%. Then in September, it goes down. So you have to do the calculation to see socially, how are you doing this to benefit society? That is why we settled on July for artisanals and July, August for the trollers so that at least there will be some a cohort of baby fish releasing to we, We've been doing this close season, I think, for about three years, if my memory says me right. Are we seeing the impact? The, the impact ground? does not come overnight. It has to be long. It has to be sustained. Whilst you close the season, when you open the season, you have to enforce the rules, the mesh size, who is doing what. I took fishermen to Philippines. And at some point in time, people are at the beach and they can use their hands to catch the fish. Children bring their buckets, they put it in the waves and the buckets are full. That is happiness. That is putting money in the pockets of fishermen and not to give them premix to sell and make profit and mm. say there. Mm. We have to come up with innovative ways. Close season is a very good management measure. If we do this thing for 10 years and we all obey the rules, our import pace will reduce. Right. I'm told we have uh, Mr. Enimba, Deputy Minister of Fishes and Aquaculture Development. Sorry we lost you there. Uh, he's back on phone. So uh, your concluding remarks, uh, you've told us what you're doing uh, in dealing with the issue of SECO and uh, trying to ens ensure that the law is enforced. But we've just been having a conversation about uh, the amount of fish we import. In fact, we're told uh, that we about $200 million annually Correct me if I'm, if I'm wrong there, but $200 million of fish annually, that's a lot of money that we are taking outside this country. Uh, how do we deal with the problem of depleting fish stock briefly uh, as we wrap up the conversation and ensure that when our fishermen go to the sea and they, they, they go with the hope of catching fish, they're able to do so and make some profit? Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Zoom, zoom out a bit friendly. So, but Sorry about that. that. Yeah. <laughs> but um, um, it, it, it's, all, it's all about increasing local And I'm happy at listening to what he has said. Ensuring that all the multi dimensional approach towards uh, restocking the market. So, uh, hello, sir. Sorry, I sorry I have to interrupt. We can barely hear you. Uh, if you can get closer to your phone, or if you're in a windy area, if you can just uh, relocate, we'll be grateful. Can, can, can you hear me now? Much, can you hear me now? Much better. Much better. It's better. Okay. Thank you. I'm saying that it's a multi-dimensional uh, issue. Mm. that we need to <coughs> and work on. Uh, Kofi mentioned close season, which is one of them, and where when to do the close season matters. The other critical aspect in relation to close season is after the close season, we must make sure that the illegal approach ends. Because when we do the close season and at the end of the day, we go back to the illegal fishing, then, then it will not uh, benefit the desirable outcome that we intended. And therefore, we are also putting uh, our time on that issue and telling our artisanal fisher folks that after the closing, please, your dynamite, the use of dynamite, the use of cupboard, 
the use of the smaller net at all must give way so that we do responsible fishing. And that is what will sustain the outcome of the closed season. So closed season is one. The gear regime is second, which of course is also very important. Once we become successful in the trough fleet, yet the gear regime, which of course is not going to be a port inspection alone, a sea intermittent inspection, where you will lift your net for our technical people to observe. And suddenly what you show them at port is it the same thing that you do in our sea. So that one will also continue. And I know that our COVID has been using and being our difficulty and our base, but we are improving on that and making sure that we put in so much resources into the marine police, into the inspectors. And then the MCS, yesterday I spoke about the MCS, which is the heartbeat of all this assignment when it comes to control, monitoring, and surveillance. So we are strengthening the, 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 the MCS. We saw some lapses in terms of human resources. We are augmenting it and making sure that we get that one also right. So with the gear regime, which of course is, is being tied to renewal of lines, because now we've told them between now and 1st September, right to us that we are ready, the MCS will come and inspect. The Ghana Maritime Authority is also up up in their game. In fact, we've had a serious interaction and engagement with them. They are now going to make sure safety measures and uh, crew issues, uh, health health care and other things are all within their remit under the ship, Ghana Shipping Act. They are having, they are also making sure that mm. everything will be we, that. Sorry, that sir. Is, we need to wrap this up quickly, but just before you go, what is the resource capacity of the MCS you talk about? No, the, the, the resource capacity, we need to beef up the human resource. And therefore, we are, we are getting them before. We need the VMS as a kid. We are grading the VMS. We, we and the service provider have agreed to that one. The next one that's coming in is an, is an upgrade of the, current, of the current one. The observers also are also at each, the inspectors. We are bringing up very strong inspectors new mindset and all reorientation, attitudinal change, doing the right things regardless. These are the culture that we need to provide to our hands. <coughs> but at the end of the day, you do automation, you do all these things. You still cannot take the human out of what we are doing. And therefore, treatment is also key. Now we are saying that look, when you treat the law, you go with report to the police, as I speak to you, about 13 or 14 of them have been reported to the police and they are handling it. They are reported for what exactly? What exactly were they involved in? Different forms of infraction. Okay. Dumping and all. And different forms of infraction that have been reported and we have the evidence to speak to the police. The police are investigating and then it will end up at court. If you want out of court settlement, it should be the court that will determine out of court settlement or not. So, for now, as far as the 625 is concerned and it's later regulated, we are applying the law and the minister is very strong on this matter and we are not reneging on any of this because we realize that it's only discipline that can help us, proper discipline that can help us restore the marine which is that was giving us about 80% uh, local production. And mm. whilst we didn't have a budget long term, we can uh, negate the marine sector mm. and it's going to be. That, that's so, also been... So, mm. God willing, we also get the research better. We get the right. research better with the four former patrol boats, which is also going to affect the MCS and then the marine police. Mm. and the entire ministry, and then the F. So with this being done gradually, we should be able to have our time on the challenges and get to those things, and then keep on improving. And I say that it is the sustainability aspect that is also key. Yesterday, the yellow card, for instance, we can't get out of it and be slapped the third time. So mm. whatever we've done to ensure we are actually able to we mm -hmm. should be able to sustain it, and it should be in perpetuity. Sustainability in this and continuous improvement in this area mm -hmm. are the way forward. And that is a change of doing the right things regardless being the culture of us. 
to be the way forward. Right. Then you should also help us in this and, and make sure that whenever, yes, you are supposed to say the better, but when you need, you know the right things. I think that seeing the right things for, for to help Ghana should also be your, your cause. Right. You say something you are listening to here, listening to here, and allow the public to judge. You know, help us in this case. So where the right things are there, please also propound those right things and let's change the attitude of our people and let's do the other thing that we are responsible to do. And then I know we'll get out of this challenge. Mr. Lane, talking about sustainability, the issue of subsidizing premix fuel, is that sustainable? You see, we we really dealing with a fleet that we all know, uh, let me use the right word, are poor in, 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 in terms of certain uh, or socioeconomic uh, benefit, we think that uh, we should uh, do for now uh, supplement premium uh, so that at least the fisher food will also be supported in a way. Right. What, what is important is that the premium must reach the one who really qualifies for it. And that's why we want to do the automation. And with the automation thing, we should be able to get it. But until then, we are also making sure that whatever we can do for it to reach out to yeah, them, that is it. So and and this automation you talk about, right. sorry to interject, sir, this automation you talk about, when are we hoping to uh, fully implement? We, we, we've, got it, we've got it to the procurement level already. Uh, there's going to be a pilot one recently at uh, Elmina. Uh, they have three of the ports around, one pilot is at Elmina, and then just after the pilot, able to start getting the 300 uh, landing beaches for for now we've taken hold of about 140 of the landing beaches that the, 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 we, we've done the necessary in the Soviet the other ones that uh, we have having challenges ownership and all that we are solving it. so we've given ourselves hopefully uh, early next year there about we should see a roll out of, okay. of, of the automation for, for, mm -hmm. for it and gradually will cover all the 300 uh, and landing. The other landing beach that we can put lamp them together, the other landing beach that uh, the canoes are so small and it, it will not be uh, cost effective to bring a whole. Uh, hello, Mr. Nim. Well, lo looks like we lost him, but he made his point. Uh, thank you for your time, Moses Enemus, Deputy Minister of Fisheries and Aquaculture Development. So wrapping up with you in the studio, Mr. Uh, Aboga, you've heard, we've heard a lot of the measures being put in place, premix fuel automation, hopefully roll out beginning of next year. Are you confident that we're on the right path? Well, there has to be a start, and uh, we have come a very long way. Uh, I believe that if we continue on this trajectory, we'll be able to make gains. But what is important is that education, education, education of fishermen and the general public. From where I sit, everybody sees fish on the market, so we don't know the crisis that we are going through. Government is feeling the pinch, importing over 200 million Dollars. dollars worth of fish before we can make up for our fish demands. 20 years ago, we were so self-sufficient. We never had to buy fish from any country. But now we're going to Morocco, we're going to Mauritania, Namibia, and other places in Europe to bring fish. And uh, more recently, when you go to the market, what they call salmon mm. or the mackerel, everybody wants the Abidjan mackerel and one wonders whether there is mackerel in the Abidjan Sea and not in the Ghana Sea. So there are a whole lot of issues there that we need to look at but more importantly I think that uh, to a large extent the fishermen will tell you keep the politics out of the fishery, keep the patronage out and let the systems work. Some are saying that if they are found culpable, exact the law, so that uh, the other person will know that when it happens to him too, 
there will be no mercy. It is not too good to criminalize our fathers who are fishermen, sending them to jail and others. But uh, we need to educate them to be more responsible in the act. But they are, they in themselves are responsible. But when the other person is doing it and nothing happens to that person, mm. then uh, you it can't, go, room you can't go hungry with your family. So mm. you need to, uh, as mm. it were, also be involved in it. Right. I appreciate that you could join us this morning. Kofi Agboga is executive director of Hen Impuano. I'm talking.